here together. Uh, there's been so much traveling in the month of October, and then uh, I know uh, Hannah, of course, has been staying with Grandma Marie and then going to church with her on on Sundays. And it's just nice that we're all here together. Uh, it's it's I you know I know you don't believe this, but I, I enjoy seeing you guys. Uh, it, it is it's a great uh, a great time to be here and to be able to worship the Lord together. Um, go ahead and mention uh, again as a quick reminder a few of the prayer requests. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Larry Lafferty and, and Sister Lafferty. I know uh, she has lost a loved one this week. And uh, continue to pray for that church there in New Testament. We, they, of course, uh, help support us, and we appreciate them very much. Brother Larry has always been... Uh, an encouragement to me just with the zeal and the effort that he shows and uh, toward mission work and the idea of reaching the community. Uh, me and him were able to visit a little bit before he went home and uh, he wanted to come see the, the, the building here and so I gave him a tour and we talked a little bit about the area. Uh, but continue to pray for them. They have a mission work that they themselves are sponsoring. Um, uh, out of their church there at New Testament and uh, uh, sounds like things are going well there. So just continue to remember remember them and the other churches that, that support us. You know, um, the Lord has put on their heart that they want to be a part, and we're thankful for that. And, uh, you know, a lot of that, you know, the, the, a lot of those funds that they give are the things that we've been using to do the extra stuff we do in the community, right? The the books of John and the, and, the, and the bags and the pens and the things that we have to hand out and the flyers that we've been doing. Um, we're, we tend to use some of the, uh, the, the tithes and offerings to help pay for the, the bills, for the rent. And it's those churches that have been uh, sending us that extra support that has really, in a lot of ways, uh, enabled us to be able to do some of the extra stuff that we do. And so let's pray for those churches. We're thankful for them. Uh, I also ask you to pray for uh, Brother Phil uh, and Sister Rhonda there at uh, Independence. Um, he had to have emergency surgery yesterday and uh, just continue to pray for him. I'm thankful that uh, the Lord provided uh, and they were able to get him in when they did and that uh, he made it through the surgery good. Uh, but I know he's got a long road in front of him. So continue to pray for Brother Phil and Sister Rhonda. Um, and others that we know of that are struggling with health problems uh, right now. Just remember those things, all right? Matter of fact, let's go ahead and get started this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Uh, Lord, there's many things around us, lots of stuff going on, but we see your hand in each and everything, and we're so thankful for that. Lord, we ask you might uh, forgive us for the times when we aren't uh, faithful or when we, we seem to doubt or we fear, and Lord, we just ask you might just help us, strengthen us. We need your strength and your boldness. Lord, we do ask that you might be with those that are struggling. I know uh, there's several on my mind today that have uh, pretty serious health problems. And Lord, we just lift them up to you today and we ask that you might provide healing for them. And that during these times of trials and troubles that you'll, uh, Lord, you'll be with them, that you'll show them your presence and that they will feel your presence in their life. And Lord, we ask you might just help us that we might be an encouragement to them. Uh, Lord, continue to be with independence. Help them, encourage them. Be with Brother Wayne and Sister Jesse, Lord, as they're going to be traveling. Provide uh, safe travels for them. We're thankful that they have that opportunity. And Lord, we ask again that you might just continue to bless here at Wheatfield. We're thankful for how you've blessed and uh, those that you've added to us. And uh, Lord, those that have come and visited, and even though they may not have come back, uh, Lord, we trust that uh, what they heard while they were here uh, might have been an encouragement. You might use it in their lives. And Lord, that we might uh, be able to reach this community for you, that your name might be lifted up and praised and glorified here in this area. We thank you again for the many blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to be continuing this message or maybe message is not the right way to say it. Uh, we're going to continue the study that I've titled Old in the New. And the idea here is that as you look at the New Testament, you see time and time and time again how they are drawing from the Old Testament scriptures. And, and we've made this point repeatedly that you can't, you can't say, oh, well, we're in the New Testament and we just get to throw the Old Testament out the door. 
Listen, the New Testament is full of references to the Old Testament. And let me tell you, uh, sometimes even when the, Old, in the New Testament is not quoting the Old Testament, it's fulfilling it, or it's obviously uh, based, not based, that's not even the right word. I mean, it is, it's just a continuation of the same story, right? And so as the, as the, as the, the apostles and the other writers in, in the New Testament are inspired by God to write these things down, no surprise that it is full of Old Testament references. And what we've been doing, of course, is we've been going through, uh, we went through the book of 1 Peter, and we started in chapter 1, and we worked our way all the way through to the end of chapter 5, the end of that book. And in every single chapter in the book of 1 Peter, he quotes an Old Testament scripture. In chapter 2, he quoted many Old Testament scriptures. Now, we're not going to be back in 1 Peter today. We're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's neat how this works. There was actually a verse toward the end of this chapter uh, that was covered this week during the Bible Institute, and it, and it drew to my mind this lesson we've been going through because one of the verses toward the end of this chapter is actually a reference to an Old Testament scripture. And so I thought, oh, what a great chapter to do next. And as I was going through studying the chapter, guess what? I found that there were at least three other direct references beyond the one I was thinking of to an Old Testament scripture verse. And so um, we're going to go ahead and cover this chapter here. It is a lot of reading, and, and today being the first, uh, this morning being the first lesson on this, I'm going to read the whole chapter. And so you'll have to be patient with me because it's, it's a fairly long chapter. But I will remind you as I read this and we think it's long, the whole book of 1 Corinthians was a letter and when the church got it, they would not have just read one chapter. They would have read the whole book, as we call it, because it was a letter to the church at Corinth. So uh, as you think about the old and the new, right, that's the theme of what we're talking about. But the title for today's message, today's messages, is Resurrection and Victory Over Death. Okay? So the theme is old and the new, and the title is resurrection and victory over death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now I'm going to pause right there for just a second. I love the way he starts this chapter. Paul says, look, I'm going to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ that I already told you that you've already believed on, the same gospel that I heard, you know, the one where Jesus Christ came and he died for our sins, and then he rose again the third day. That one, right? If there's any mistake, that's the message that I'm talking about. And verse 5, And then he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? 
Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then, have th then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is ex expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if, they, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me, if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to, righteous, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some of other grain. But God giveth it a body, and it pleaseth him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortality must, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, that's a lot to read, but I hope that as you read through that, you got the idea that, that Paul starts off with this idea of, let me tell you what, the gospel of Jesus Christ not only includes the life of Jesus Christ, it also includes the death of Jesus Christ, and it also involves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something else. There are still witnesses living today. Now, I'm, this, is P, this is Paul talking, right? He is saying there are still witnesses living today that saw him arise from the dead. And part of the gospel that we preach to you is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And then he goes in and he tells us a problem. I'm hearing that some of you at Corinth are declaring that there is no resurrection of the dead. That's a problem. Right? And then Paul goes in and he starts to talk about if there's no resurrection, here's the problem you have. Let me just describe it for you, right? Here's the problem you're going to have if there's no resurrection. And then he goes in and he says, but, but listen, the good news, there is a resurrection. And I know it because I saw Jesus Christ. And if there is a resurrection, you get to take part in that resurrection. And if you get to take part in that resurrection, there's got to be a change. Because listen, that old worthless corruptible body that you have you've been adopted into the family yes and you've been promised that you're going to spend an eternity with him but listen there's going to have to be some more change to you before you're going to stand in eternity with him that is my one minute recap of what took 10 minutes to read and so what we want to do is we just want to go through that concept in a little bit deeper study and as we do it, I'm going to try to draw out the verses that Paul refers to. And I'm just going to warn you right now, it's going to be really hard for me to say Paul because we have spent weeks now talking about Peter. And I'm going to occasionally say Peter and you will just have to forgive me. So let's start here in verses 1 through 11. And I'm not going to reread all of these. But, but listen, in verses 1 through 11, what Paul is doing is he is declaring... Before he ever announces what the problem is, he's declaring the Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And listen, if you don't believe it, let me remind you of all of the people that have been telling you that he rose from the dead. He says, first off, it's part of the gospel message. The very gospel message that I preached to you guys when you were saved the first, at first, remember? Remember? And beyond that, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he was seen of Cephas, which would be Peter, right? Peter saw him. And listen, if anybody should know who he is, it would be Peter. And then he was seen of the other apostles. And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Listen. If you don't believe Peter and the other apostles, well, how about the 500 other people that saw him? And listen, I know some of those people have passed on. But I'm telling you, some of those people, this is Paul speaking, some of those people are still alive today, and if you want to go ask them about it again, you can. We're not talking about, when Paul wrote this letter, Paul's not talking about a bunch of people that died a long, long time ago. He's saying, look, people that you could meet and greet today saw Jesus Christ. Now, you and me, none of those people are alive today, okay? But we have a great, great witness of his resurrection. It was a multitude of people at different times, at different places. People that, honestly, if we, if we really look at it, people that to admit that Jesus Christ was risen were putting themselves back in the crosshairs of persecution. People that could have just quietly snuck off and been left alone, probably, 
they've now seen the Savior risen, and they are publicly declaring his resurrection. I read somewhere that they talked about, you know, uh, a lot of people believe that the apostles uh, actually stole the body of Christ. And somebody pointed out that, you know, that grave was guarded by Roman soldiers, was sealed with a Roman seal. For them to have taken the body of Christ would have been to have taken their life in their own hands. They would have had to have overpowered the guards, guards, by the way, which suffer the persecution of death if they don't accomplish the work that's given them. It's just interesting as you start to dig into all of the details surrounding that. And we're not going to get there today because I won't get anywhere if we do that. But listen, Paul is saying there's not a shortage of witnesses that have seen the risen Savior. Beyond the 500, he says, and then James, and then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Paul saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, saw him in person. And I believe from the way that that account is written and from the way this is stated, Paul didn't just hear the voice, but at some point in his, at some point he actually saw Jesus Christ. Listen, he's telling them, I have seen the risen Savior. So our first point here that we just covered, these first few verses, listen, don't get caught up. The point of this passage is not who saw Jesus Christ first. I realize he kind of runs through this list. We know that from looking at some of the Gospels that Mary may have actually been the very first person to see Jesus Christ risen. The point is not who saw him first. The point is that Paul is giving them this pretty impressive list of the eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Savior. Paul points out that this is all part of the Gospel and that this is the message that you first believed unto salvation. So I love how he takes those first 11 verses and he says, remember the gospel that you preached, that I preached? Remember the gospel that you believed? Remember the resurrected Savior that, man, all these people, including me, have personally witnessed? And then he gets into a second point, which is, false teaching about the resurrection, and that starts in verse 12. He says all of that, and then, you know, I don't know, i, I got to imagine that as this is being read to the church at Corinth, which it would have been, right? When they got it, they would have read the letter to the church at Corinth. i got to believe at this point there's some people out in the congregation that are starting to squirm a little bit. Paul's really driving home this resurrection, resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. And, and if you've read the rest of Paul's letter, he's not afraid to call you out and say, there's a problem in your midst. And if I'm some of those that are saying there is no resurrection, I'm probably squirming a little bit at this point. In verse 12, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he arose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? The gospel that you guys believed had resurrection as a key part of it. I personally have told you about the resurrected Savior. How is it that if the gospel is rooted and grounded in the resurrection of our Savior, how is it that some of you say there's no such thing as a resurrection from the dead? Now you're really squirming if you're one of those. But then what you notice, and Paul, I don't know that Paul Paul is saying this in regards to those that are teaching falsely as much as he's saying it for those that may be hearing it. But Paul starts to make some points. And this is a good thing for us to do. I'm going to mention, and this is a little bit of a rabbit, but I think it's a good example. 
what Paul is about to do is show them that when you start to get off point, it starts to fall apart, right? There are some denominations out there that if you study their history, they started to accept something that wasn't scriptural. It was extra biblical. And as they started to accept that, you had to make another rule or another law or another ex exception because that caused a question, <laughs> which then caused you to have to create something else. And now what happens? Well, now you've got to create something else. And suddenly you've got books upon books to explain the exceptions to what you were doing that was different than the Scripture. And that's a little bit about what Paul is starting to describe to them. He says, look, if you're going to start to say there's no resurrection, well, what about Jesus Christ? And if Jesus Christ, if there's no resurrection from the dead, well, then Jesus Christ must not be risen from the dead. And if Jesus Christ isn't risen from the dead, then I'm a liar. And the message that you believed was a lie. And the message that I believed was that, that I preached to you was that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again, that you might be forgiven of your sins. And if I lied about Jesus Christ being risen from the dead, then you're still a sinner. You're still in your sins. We're all still sinners, but he's saying, you've not been forgiven of your sins. You start to see how that everything that Jesus Christ, everything that God lays out is built upon each other. And if you start to take out this stone, you're going to weaken that wall, and you're going to take out this stone, and suddenly everything around you is going to start to crumble. I think it's why that when you look at the Old Testament, God was so serious about the pictures that he had drawn and why they needed to be followed specifically. Because if he has given this picture of the coming Messiah and you change it and tweak it a little bit and do it a little bit different, well, you've just changed the picture of his coming Messiah. I think that is the reason why sometimes when you look at the Old Testament, you say, okay, so they didn't do it. They really didn't follow it exactly the way God said to do it, but yeah, close enough. God, God generally in those cases came back and said, no, it's not. So there is serious repercussions to this false teaching. And I don't know whether or not there were some Jews that were saved in the church of Corinth that had been Sadducees or where did they come up with this idea that there's no resurrection? Maybe you have some pagan who had been redeemed and teachings that he has from old you know, I don't know. I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a believer in this one Christ, but man, I just, I don't know about this whole coming back from the dead thing. Well, Paul sets it straight. Listen, if you don't believe that, why do you believe any of it? If Christ didn't risen from the dead, then your sins have not been washed away. And at one point he even says, man, if Christ isn't risen then we're still in bondage to sin. And how miserable is our life? At least the people that don't believe this go about their life living and enjoying life. We're brutal and grounded everything in this story about Christ only to find out it's not real. When we die, we're dead. Man, we're the most miserable people around. You start to chip away at that foundation and start to say, well, that's not real, and that's not real, and I don't believe that. I believe, I believe Christ was, he was just a good guy. We should follow his teachings. Well, listen, if you believe that, you might as well just scrap the whole thing. Without Christ's resurrection, it is all in vain. That's what he said, right? For if if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. He says, listen, those of your loved ones that had believed and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, if there's no resurrection, then they're just dead. They're gone. There is no hope. You 
if there's no resurrection, we're a really poor, helpless, hopeless people. Matter of fact, I want you to see the despair. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. In verse 32, in verse 32, Paul comes back and says this a little bit later. He says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Understand, there had been, Paul himself had been beaten and stoned and jailed and all other kinds of problems, right? I think there were probably saints that at this point had already been murdered for the cause of Christ. He says, hey, if, if, if I get in and I have to fight those beasts at Ephesus, if there's no resurrection, man, what's the point? I might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. You see the despair in those statements? Do you really? I mean, that's what I want you to see. The total despair in those statements. Paul is saying, What's the point of all the zeal and the effort that we would show for the cause of Christ if when we die we're just dead? He said, we might as well just go out and have a good time because we're going to die. That's what he means when he says, if Christ isn't risen, then your faith is vain and you're still in your sins and there's just no point to any of this. And then he starts to get into this idea of, uh, let's look in verse 20. But now, because he changes, he's, he talks about the resurrection and the witnesses. And then he talks about the problem, which is that some of you don't believe. And he starts to outline where that leads. But then he comes back with a hopeful message in verse 20. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead? He says, look, you can talk about Christ not being risen, and here's the problems with that. But listen, I'm here to tell you, he is risen. So let's just stop talking about that. Christ is risen. Let's take it from that angle. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. Listen, as you look at those verses, your faith is not vain, because Christ is risen. And then he goes into this dialogue about, let me go all the way back to the beginning. And let's talk about how that death came because of man. Death came because man could not fulfill the command of God. But let me tell you now, resurrection is possible because another man was able to fulfill the command of God and did give himself to pay for your sins and is risen from the dead to show that he has victory and power even over death. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. You actually see a very similar uh, story, that, the, the way that Peter tells it, or Paul tells it in Romans. He says this in multiple places, this idea of <laughs> by one man came sin, and by one man came life. I want you to notice just a couple things. Um, for as in Adam all die, and even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He follows up that verse to say, look, let there be no mistake. When I say by one man came death and by another man came resurrection, let me just be clear. I'm talking about Adam and I'm talking about Christ, right? 
He takes away any arguments or things that people might try to say about who he's talking about. I'm talking about Adam and I'm talking about Christ. He also talks a little bit about being the first fruits of them that slept. And in verse 23, he talks about every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. He's saying, look, Jesus Christ was the first fruits of the resurrection. There will be another reaping, another gathering at his coming. And later he's going to talk about uh, the, the, the blink of the eye and the trump sounding and all of us being changed, right? But he's referring to it even up here. He says, look, Christ was the first fruits of it. The rest of you are coming. Now, what's neat about this, me and Tanya have been watching this, uh, this series about, uh, it was a guy that was born and raised as an Orthodox Jew. Uh, he was later saved. And, and he is, he's got this series where he teaches about uh, how the feasts represent the redemption story. And it's really neat because he starts with Sabbath, which is not necessarily a feast, but he talks about that being representative of the rest of God that's coming. And then he goes into things like Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the First, the, the, the first Fruits and, and all of these things. And he's talking about how those represent, those are pictures of the story of Messiah. We don't associate with this idea very much of the first fruits, right? We don't really, it doesn't mean a lot to us as Gentiles who haven't been born and raised with those things. But as I've read through this and I've looked at it, uh, it's really neat because, uh, and I, this is, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I never realized the timing of the first fruits. You've got the Passover. We associate with that, right? The Lamb of God was slain as the Passover Lamb. But did you know that the first fruits was this thing of where they would go out and they would cut of the first parts of the harvest before they gathered everything. They would go take of the fields and they would put it in a sheaf and, and there was a whole bunch of things they did to it and I'm not going to get into that. But they would wave this in all four directions, right? Before the Lord in the temple. That occurred three days after the Passover. So as you think about this, Jesus Christ died as our Passover lamb. He resurrected when the priest would have been doing the first fruit in the temple, which is the idea of bringing of the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest, sanctifying it and setting it aside and giving it to God. And then once that's accepted, the rest of the harvest can occur. And so when Paul goes on and he's talking about resurrection, and when Paul starts talking about him being the first fruits, it's no mistake, and it carries a lot. If, you're, if you had been born and raised an Orthodox Jew, this statement about Christ's resurrection representing the first fruits would carry a lot more meaning to it than it has for us. And so listen, he says, yes, the resurrection is true. And by the way, not only is the resurrection true, but it is a picture of how Christ is the first fruits that have been presented before God in the resurrection. And in time... The rest of us will be harvested. Hard way to say it when you think about humans, but you know the, the idea is that we will be gathered together as well. Christ being the first fruits. So although he may not be quoting a scripture verse here, he is absolutely hailing back to what's taught in the Old Testament about this idea of the, the, the first fruits. And Christ represents the first fruits. Now we also want to talk a little bit about this idea about death 
coming by one man and resurrection coming by man. We know that sin entered into the world uh, by the sin of Adam. Life and resurrection is available through the work of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. And if you don't believe that, you should go read what he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. I'm not going to turn there for time's sake. But in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, he says almost the same thing, but he's a little bit more specific about it. But the other thing that he talks about, as he's building up to this idea, by the way, of part of this is that Jesus Christ has power over even death, right? That's an overarching theme to this chapter. And death by many would be considered an enemy. And it really is, because what does death come from? The wages of sin is death. The only reason death exists is because sin exists. I'd say that's a pretty good definition of an enemy. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 25, he says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And in verse 27 he says, For he hath put all things under his feet. This idea here is, yes, he's risen. Yes, he has power. Yes, he's coming again. He's going to deliver us. He's going to show that he has, when he hath put down all rule and all authority and all power. Listen, that is not just talking about the physical things. When the Lord comes back and he rules and reigns in this earth, it's not just that he can overthrow governments. It's not just that he can put down the power of a rebellion. He's saying, look, he is going to put all things under his feet. When he, has, when he has put down all rule, well, what is one thing that we all will have to go through? Death, which is the wages of sin. Well, there's coming a day, and I think to some degree you could say Christ has already overcome death. But listen, he's overcome death in his resurrection, but there's coming a time when there will be no more death. And he will have totally and completely put it under his feet. This is actually hailing back, if you would, turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 110. And we don't hardly have time to cover all of these verses here, but I think you have to understand that although there may be multiple meanings to some of these chapters and Psalms, it is commonly understood that these, that these Psalms also are talking about Messiah. So Psalms chapter 110, I'm going to read this for you. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The picture there is what? That all of his enemies have been put under his feet. <laughs> well, what did it say back there in 1 Corinthians? That his enemies would be put under his feet. If you don't think that this is talking about uh, the Messiah, you should go down further where it talks about thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek and, and all of these references. This is talking about the Messiah. It says there's coming a time when all of the enemies will be made a footstool. In other words, they're all going to be under your feet. I firmly believe that Paul is referring back to this reference here in Psalms chapter 110. And you can also look in Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8, verse 6. I'm going to back up a verse to put context a little bit here. You can look at this verse, and there may be some references. Sometimes when you look at prophecy, there can be multiple meanings, okay? And there can be a practical application to this psalm. But we know from other verses that are in this psalm that Christ himself or others refer to this chapter as being a picture of him. Matter of fact, verse 5 is one that you may be familiar with. It says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Listen, this is not just talking about any man. We know that Christ from the Gospels talks about that he was made lower than the angels. The one that was great and powerful was made lower than the angels and took on the form of a man. Well, the very next verse here says, Thou hast made him to have dominion over thy work, the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under 
his feet. Listen, there is coming a time when Jesus Christ will have put down all rule and all power and all authority and all enemies will be under his feet. Even if Paul is not intentionally directly quoting Psalms 110 and Psalms 8, which I think he actually is, but even if he isn't, the, the, the principle with which he is describing is absolutely taught in the Old Testament. Thou hast had dominion over all things. Listen, Adam, when the world was first created and formed, Adam was given dominion over the beasts and the fowls of the air and things like that. But listen, Christ is given dominion over everything. Everything. Christ had victory over death at his resurrection. But I'm telling you, there's an even deeper victory over death that's coming. Because right now, you and I are still faced with death. If you ask people, what is one thing that every person will go through in this life? Is death. Unless the Lord comes back and we go to meet him in the air that way, we will all see death. But there's coming a day when death will be gone. And Jesus Christ will have shown that he has power over everything. So what's the message in this first half? And uh, we're going to have to stop there for time's sake. But to recap, listen, there are tons of witnesses that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And in Paul's day, some of them, including himself, were still alive. Paul seen him later. At Paul's time, there were still people that had seen him those just a few days after his resurrection. Don't discount it. When people try to come and say, look, I get it. Christ was a powerful figure in this world, but I find it hard to believe that he actually died and then took his life back. Well, then you might as well not believe any of it. Because without that, any faith that you have would be in vain anyways. And then take courage in the fact that, no, Christ is risen. And because he's risen, there's coming a day when he will put all enemies under his feet, just like it said in Psalms two different times. It is through Jesus Christ and his resurrection that you can have life. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say spiritual life, which those of you that are saved already have. But there's coming a day when you will have spiritual life and I personally believe physical bodies that are without sin and incorruptible. All of that is only possible because Jesus Christ came and died and rose again. Now we're going to stop there for this morning. This afternoon we're going to try to finish out this chapter. And it's interesting uh, because I'm going to, the, the fourth point is the logical argument versus the spiritual argument. Because even after saying all this, Paul understands there's going to be people that come back and try to claim something else. We're going to talk about Adam versus Christ again. And then we're going to talk about the coming change that you and I will see at some point. All right. So those are the things that we hope to cover this afternoon. We'll see if we get that far. Uh, but we are glad that you guys are able to be here. We hope that you've been uh, enjoying this study about the old and the new. And uh, I, after we get through some of this, or maybe even while we're doing some of it, I'm going to have to get deeper into this whole thing about how the feast and things like that represent uh, Christ, because that is so neat. Uh, how that one verse that had nothing to do with that drew me to this chapter. And as I was reading this chapter, it so happens to be the chapter that talks about Christ being the first fruits as we were listening to this thing about that picture being what it is. So uh, I'm pretty excited about some of this. It's, it's really neat study to see the Lord Jesus Christ in both the Old and the New Testament. All right, Brother Philip, would you come and lead us in a song, please?